friends, and welcome back. I'm Mark Baker, and in today's program, we're going to conclude our discussion about the path to power. We've been looking in Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, and we've seen that Paul gave us a list of things that he desired for the eyes of understanding to be open. The one thing we've been talking about, and the one consistent thing as we're moving through this, is a theme of relationship. I talked a lot about that in the last program. God desires to have a relationship with you and I. We're entering into a time of turmoil, of great change, and we need to get back to that concept of relationship. It is so interesting to me over the years in talking to people, when I talk about spending time with the Holy Spirit, when I talk about just sitting down to talk to Him, for so many people, that is a foreign concept. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, it says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, the communion, the sharing together of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Everything comes back to relationship, friend. What is happening, though, is we are seeking what he can do for us instead of who he is. We're seeking what we can get from him instead of what we can give him. It may not be conscious. We may not be doing this on purpose. But listen to people. Look around. Carol and I were just at a service recently and watching the people run and dance. And I then go back to their seats and just talking during worship. And just, it was, it was like being with a bunch of children that just, I, I don't know how to describe it. Like I, I said in the previous program, I've seen the real. And God so desires to bring us back to that real. But friend, we are not going to be able to discern the real from the fake without being able to discern. And that discernment comes from relationship. The more time you spend with the Spirit, the more time you spend with your with him meditating in the word, fellowshipping with him around the word, the more you're going to be able to, be able to identify the real from the fake. I, As I'm sitting here looking at this and thinking about this, the Holy Spirit's reminding me, you know, of a situation with Rehoboam. And let's go back to Second Chronicles, I believe it's in chapter 12. In Israel, when they built the temple, they adorned it. They, the furnishings were gold. It was amazing inside. It was the place of the presence. They put the best of the best in there. But then over time, enemies came, enemies rose up, and things began to change. And I'm reminded a lot of times when I look at this of the situation that happened under Rehoboam's reign. In First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 9, we'll start there. It says, So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. He took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all and carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made, instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them, fetched the brass shields, the fresh armor, and brought them again into the guard chamber. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him, that he would not destroy him altogether. And in Judah things went well. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. 
and his mother's name was Naamah, an Ammonitess, and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. So some important things we see here is Egypt came and they ransacked the temple. They took all of the treasures of the temple. The church started out in the fire of God. The church started out in the fire of revival. In, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus told his disciples that the traditions of men would make the word of God of no effect. When you look in the book of Acts, you see constant references to the word growing, the word expanding. The gospel message was being preached. But then over time, the enemy has entered into the camp and ransacked the temple of the Lord. The Bible calls us the temple of the Holy Spirit. He has stolen the gold from the temple, and unfortunately we have replaced it, just as Rehoboam did, with brass. There are things that we call holy that are actually just brass elements. We have allowed the enemy to ransack the church and fill it with tradition. And our traditions are coated in brass, just as these were coated in brass in the temple. We've allowed brass to be brought into the temple, and we've accepted second best. But friend, as we come into the end of the age, as we walk into what God has for us, the only way we're going to be able to discern truth from error, truth from tradition, truth from doctrine is by pressing into that relationship. And I want you, the second thing I want you to notice from this passage, and then we'll go back over to Ephesians chapter 1, and, and I encourage you, if you don't have your Bible, to grab it, to look at it, put your eyes on it for yourself. But notice what it says here. In verse 14, he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Why did he do evil? Because he prepared not his heart to seek evil to seek the Lord. So many times I hear people say, well, I just can't help myself. I can't help myself. I keep falling into this. I can't help myself. Think about that statement there. He did evil because he prepared not his heart. We have done people such a disservice by not discipling them in the word, by not teaching them and guiding them. The reason we have habits, the reason we fall back into things, the reason we do these things is because we have not been trained how to prepare our hearts to seek the Lord. Once again, circling back to relationship. We've made things so complicated, friend, and it doesn't need to be that way. I think over to, to, for, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Let's turn over there before we get into our text in Ephesians as we close this out. But we have complicated things and made things overly complicated. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll start in verse 1. It says, Would to God that you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly je jealousy, for I have espoused to you one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Would I fear by any man's as a servant beguiled evil, Eve, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Notice that phrase, the simplicity that is in Christ. When we look at this and we think about walking in the power of God, when we look at this and think about it, the gospel message is really simple. If you look back, you know, to the book of Acts, you see them walking in power. They did not have a written Bible with 66 books in it as you and I have today. We have so much more revelation available to us than even Paul walked in because he did not have the revelation of Peter. He did not have the revelation of James. He did not have the revelation of John. We have all these things written out for us but we've moved away from the simplicity that is in Christ. We've overly complicated things, friend, 
And this is something we need to get back to. I mean, you see Peter and John in, for, in Acts chapter 3, they were coming to the gate beautiful. They saw the lame man sitting there. He asked for an offering. He asked for them to give, them, give him a handout. Peter responded, says, silver and gold have I none, but what I have give I you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. You see, Peter didn't have a written Bible, but he spent three to three and a half years with Jesus. We already looked at the beginning of the series in Luke chapter 4, that Jesus went into the temple and as his custom was, in other words, it wasn't something he did once. It was something that he had done, you know, more than once. He opened the Bible, you know, the scroll to Isaiah. The priest even, you know, handed him the correct scroll. And he read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Peter had heard that over and over. John had heard that over and over and over. How many times? They may have heard that hundreds of times because that was Jesus' custom. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me. Friend, you have the Spirit of the Lord in you if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life. When you, conf- you know, believed in your heart and you confessed with your mouth and became a Christian, Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into your spirit. But then in Acts chapter 1, you know, we see where Jesus told the disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit. There is a second experience beyond salvation where the Holy Spirit comes upon us. But see, we overcomplicate things. I could, you know, I could do a whole series, whole, you know, a whole year's worth of programs about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, teaching you the mechanics, teaching you how to receive all these other things. But the simplest thing, open your Bible to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. There you will see that they spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. Turn off everything around you. Shut yourself away alone. Turn off your, you know, phone, your TV, your social media. Sit down with that verse and just say, Holy Spirit, I want to receive the same experience the disciples received. Can you teach me? I have known people who have done that. I believe that tongues are for today, but and it will absolutely change your life. But you have the teacher within you if you've not received that gift. Allow him to teach you. Give him an opportunity. You see, this is simple. We don't need three points in a poem. We don't need a big, long theological discourse. We just need him. If you don't understand something, you can go to your pastor, you can go to your, you know, a teacher like myself and ask us to explain, or you can just set aside time to spend with him and ask him to teach you. Make sure you take your Bible, though, because in this school of the, you know, I call it the school of the Spirit. I can your textbook is the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit always operates in line with the Word of God. I remember I went to Bible school under Kenneth E. Hagin, and I remember him talking about Jesus himself appearing to him in in a number of visions. And, you know, it was always interesting because Dr. Hagin would always ask the Lord to give him scripture and verse. And Jesus always kindly responded and didn't even get, you know, he'd ask for two or three, and Jesus would always give him more than he asked for. Because revelation knowledge will never come to you apart from the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit will not get mad. If he's showing you something, if you go to him and say, hey, I want to see this in Scripture, he'll lead you to the Scriptures. He'll teach you. He'll guide you. It is a very simple message. God sent his Son because he loved you. His son allowed his body to be broken so your body might be made whole. His son allowed himself to be crucified. He descended into the pits of hell and endured the suffering due for our sin. And then he rose from the grave. And in his resurrection, he provided everything for you that you will ever need for life and godliness. 
2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, through the knowledge of him that has called you to glory and virtue. He saw us in our sinful condition and gave us his measure of faith. He made it available to us through his word. We heard the word, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, and the Holy Spirit spoke it into our spirit through our inner ear. He birthed the faith of God. We acted on that faith in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. It says we were justified by the faith of the Son of God. We acted because when he gave birth to that faith, it created a belief in our heart that caused us to confess Jesus as Lord. At that moment, Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into our spirits. And then he said, wait, what are you doing when you're waiting? Nothing. You're sitting still. The disciples went to the upper room and they waited. Well, friend, if you have not received the anointing, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and it, it's just such goofy teaching. I've heard people say, well, you can't be saved without the Holy Spirit. Well, of course, I mean, without being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, of course you can. Because when you got saved, Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit into your spirit. But then he says, wait. What are you doing while you're waiting? You're developing relationship. Carol and I were engaged. And it happened rel relatively quickly. We met on, and I won't go into the story here today, but we met on a missions cruise in the Bahamas. I spent three days fasting and praying. The Lord said that he sent his spirit ahead of me, picked out the perfect bride. In all honesty, I, like I said, I won't go through the whole story, but I didn't believe him. I went down the next week. We got off to the boat on Friday. A week later on Saturday, I went down and asked her to marry me. We thought we were going to get married quickly, but it was four and a half years. What was I doing in those four and a half years? I was waiting. What was she doing? She was waiting. When, when she said yes, when we became engaged, we took communion and both of us heard a click in the spirit. We were joined at that moment. But then we had to wait. What were we waiting on? We were waiting until the Father said, you're ready. Four and a half years of waiting. The disciples went to the upper room to wait. They were already joined to the Lord. They were already betrothed to the Lord. They had already received the Holy Spirit because Jesus had breathed the Spirit into their spirits. What were they waiting on? They had the Spirit within them, but they were waiting for the Spirit to come upon them. Wait. That is a word that the church does not want to hear. We want to lead people through the prayer of salvation, hand them a stack of cards, and send them out with these discipleship tracts to win the world to the Lord. But Jesus didn't tell us to do that. He told us to go into the world, all the world and make disciples. A disciple is one who has been trained, who has been, you know, committed the word of righteousness. The things you see in churches today, the goofiness, people run to that because they have not been taught the word correctly. You may not be in a church necessarily that is teaching correctly. I encourage you to make sure that that's the church God wants you in, but you have the teacher within you. And we don't have an excuse. Why did Rehoboam do evil? Because he did not prepare his heart. What are you doing when you're waiting? You're preparing your heart. You're preparing your heart to walk in the mighty power of God. In the final few minutes of the program, let's look again in Ephesians chapter 1. In verse 17, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, given to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened to one, what is the hope of your calling, his calling? Number two, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And number three, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places? Far above all principality and power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. For he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So when we look at the path to power, 
we see, first of all, the hope of our calling. That word calling in the original language is pictures an invitation to salvation. In salvation, all of our needs are taken care of. Secondly, the, you know, the inheritance that is in the saints. The Holy Spirit is God's earnest money. Just like you would put earnest money down on a house, the Holy Spirit is God's earnest money. He lives within us. We develop a relationship with the Word. We develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit while we're waiting. Waiting in His presence, separated, allowing Him to separate us, allowing Him to help us prepare our hearts. If you will take the time to prepare your hearts, then you will move into the mighty power. This is the same power that Jesus, that the Holy Spirit used, that God used to pull Jesus from the grave, to pull Jesus from hell. Think about how much power was involved in that, and that is the power that resides within you, the mighty power of God, friend. It is available to you. God wants us to get rid of the brass from the temple and bring back the gold. We can do this. Jesus has opened the door, but we must step through. Jesus opened the door, but we must step through and allow him to prepare us. Friend, God loves you so much. He has so much available to you for you. And one thing that I found, and the Holy Spirit's been talking to me a lot lately, is one problem that we struggle with is, again, the simplicity of Christ. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. He has given us. And I was praying recently about why there's such a struggle with receiving. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Son, it's because my people are looking in the wrong direction. They look forward when they should be looking backwards. What does he mean by that? But well, we're looking forward to God doing the work when he has completed the work. So instead of looking forward, we should be looking backwards to the cross. Because it was at the cross that Jesus obtained an eternal redemption for us. It was at the cross that Jesus provided healing for us. It was at the cross that Jesus provided deliverance for us. It was at the cross that Jesus provided freedom. It was at the cross, and instead of looking forward, we should be looking backwards. In the last program, I said that to me, as I've been studying the cross lately, looking at it, meditating on it, what I'm seeing is a beautiful love story. Yes, it was a place of judgment. Yes, it was a place of death. Yes, it was you know, a place of unimaginable suffering. But it was also the place A, a great love story between God and his creation. It was the place where God opened the door and issued his invitation to salvation. And those who accept it, he gives the earnest of their salvation, the earnest money which promises our future redemption, the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And as we develop that relationship with the Holy Spirit in the Word, we will begin to move into the mighty power. Everything, once again, friend, comes back to relationship. Everything. And I'm seeing that so much more as I move forward, as, I as the ministry continues to build, as we continue to look at things. It is all about relationship with our Creator. That's what redemption is all about, is an invitation from God to us to join his family. He doesn't charge an entrance fee. He doesn't expect anything from us except for our willingness to accept his invitation, friend. Nothing else. He doesn't expect you to, you know, show up every, every week at church. Yes, it's good if you do those things. He doesn't expect you to serve. He doesn't, he's not a hard taskmaster. He gave everything, and the only thing he asks from us in return is just to say yes. That is amazing. He even gave us his faith 
to use to receive his invitation. He gave us his faith to act on. We don't even have to use our own faith. He gave us his faith to accept his invitation. We have no excuse, friend. There's a lot of people who have rejected him. There's a lot of people who want to blame him. There's a lot of people doing evil. But it comes back to what we saw in Chronicles. It is because they have not prepared their heart that they are doing evil. How do we prepare our heart? By accepting that invitation to salvation. You and I, friend, should be walking in the power of God. We should be expressions of his mighty power. But we've allowed tradition to replace truth. We've brought brass into the temple. And I believe what the Holy Spirit's message to us through this series is, it's time to bring the gold back in. The door is open. We've got to stop accepting second best. And you can do this. Holy Spirit led you to this program today because he believes in you. He has so much more for you. And it all comes back to saying, yes. Wow. Well, friend, our time is up today. As we close out the program, I just want to ask you once again to pray about what your part is with MB Media Ministry. We have partners who are coming alongside of us, giving monthly offerings that are enabling us to continue to grow, to put out the books, to put out this message. Will you pray about joining and ask him what your part would be? Would it be just to give a one-time offering? Or would it be come alongside of us monthly? And our desire here at MB Media Ministry is just to see fruit abounding to your account. So as we close out today, let me remind you once again, friend, you can live life to the fullest, walking by the faith of the Son of God.